Happy Monday. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is uh, August, so also a happy reinstatement month to get everybody in the mood for that. Um, this will be our, our palate cleanser. Uh, right-wing pastor Greg Locke manages to do quite a crossover effort here between vaccinations and the presidential election. This is actually a, a real a real sermon that Pastor Greg Locke gave to his church. Not my church or anything like any church that I've ever been to, but um, let's, let's play it. Uh, Pastor Greg Locke. I am not apologizing for what I said on this platform last week. The Delta variant was nonsense then. It is nonsense now. You will not wear masks in this church. You will not wear masks in this church. I'm telling you right now, do not get vaccinated. Okay. Do not no. get vaccinated. No, I don't care what you think about me. I don't need your money. I don't need your hand clap. No. I don't need more people on social media to follow me. That's good. That's good. Yeah. I ain't following yeah. along with it. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden's days are well, numbered. Wait. Switch up up there. I said they're numbered. I've told you the whole time this election was fraudulent. We got so much proof. The only people that can deny it are crack smoking, demon possessed leftists. Okay. Whoa, I'm about to tear this whole pool but in half. I have no idea what that last one was, but um, that's a great way of introducing our guest today, uh, crack-smoking, demon-possessed leftist uh, up for the day, uh, Benjamin Wittes from Lawfare joins us again on the podcast. I just want to say this, that you know, the, it was very accurate what he said, because when I was just a crack-smoking leftist, I didn't believe that Biden no. won the election. It was only when I was no. uh, no. then possessed by a demon, in addition to being the crack-smoking leftist, that I realized that Joe Biden had won the election. So I want to congratulate the pastor on on the sociological accuracy of his sense of Biden's supports. You know, it's, 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 somebody actually over the weekend said, so is it possible there's kind of a connection somehow between the people who don't believe that the coronavirus is a real problem, who oppose vaccinations, and the people who support January 6th? Is there, is there some sort of a connection? And the answer would be yes. Yes, there yeah, is. There's, um, a, there's a little bit of a connection. <laughs> there's a little bit of a through line. So this is a reinstatement month, um, Benjamin. Uh, this is the month that we were assured by my pillow guy that the president would be reinstated. He is apparently reportedly meeting with his cabinet. So uh, you're 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 from lawfare. You're like the legal guy. Your go to. So how does it actually work? Does it is it the marshal of the Supreme Court? That actually will declare that he's the president again. Now how just what's the mechanism? So I think what has to happen is, uh, you know, John Roberts, uh, who administered the oath of office to Joe Biden, uh, emerges on the steps of the Supreme Court, announces he is, you know, going to stop smoking crack. Um, and then he uh, has the demon. Um, uh, 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 you know, removed <laughs> in an exorcism ceremony, at which point he is then free to announce that he was not acting pursuant to free will when he uh, when he swore in Joe Biden. Yeah, uh, right. And of course, at that point, the Secret Service will remove Biden from yeah. from office and yeah. they can swear in uh, see, when Donald you, Trump again. When, see, when you put it when you when you put it that way, it actually sounds implausible. It, it sounds a little outlandish. There, there, there's a, well, there is a formal process in the Constitution for no. removing from office uh, crack, sm crack smoking, demon obsessed leftist and replacing them with the legitimate president. And, you know, it's it's little studied in con law classes because it happens so rarely. Well, I, the, the part about this that I always found most interesting is that at some point in the Mike Lindell, my pillow guy scenario of reinstatement, Joe Biden comes out and goes, my bad, I'm leaving. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. I'm just kind of waiting, waiting, <laughs> waiting on that, that say, hey, yeah, um, now that you've pointed this out, my pillow guy, I am, I am out. So, OK, so this is actually serious because people do get sick from all of this. But, you know, I, I don't know how you cope with it, but I cope with it by. You know, some some people are, are just totally depressed by the crazy. Um, you know what actually gets me, though? I have to admit, the crazy doesn't bother me that much. 
you know, my problem is I, I don't know about you. I hated middle school and it's so much of what we have to experience now is like this, this, it's like this flashback to middle school. It's just, it's just the, it's not just that it's stupid. It's so that it, it's so relentlessly and routinely stupid. Do you know what I mean? It's just like kind of just the meanness and the dumbness and the, just the crassness. I mean, you know, crazy I can handle. It's just, it's the, it's the, it's the playground bully dumbness. Yeah. The, so the playground bully dumbness is, and, and sort of combined with a kind of mean girls, uh, thing yeah. you know that there's a a defined kind of pecking order uh you know and uh you have to you have to pay obeisance to the current mythology and say the particular right things and all, of course all of politics is like that to an extent but i do think the world of Trumpism has elevated that stuff over the entirety of the rest of it. And and the result, of course, is that, uh, you know, it it is, among other things, wholly devoid of substance. And I, I, I also think that the there's an element of it that the more ridiculous the thing they can get you to profess that you believe the more of a power move it is, right? So if they- I think that's true, yeah. If they're merely getting you to say, you know, things that traditionally conservatives have always believed, like that marginal tax rates should be lower rather than higher, well, they're they're not actually getting you to do anything that you wouldn't do on your own. But if they can get you to say that, you know, don't wear a mask in this church- uh, the Delta variant is is fake, um, or and Trump won the election, and Joe Biden is you know going to be removed. You know that's the two plus two equals five stuff that Orwell is talking about in 1984. And you know when the party can get you to profess things that your entire internal compass knows to be untrue, it's that is really exerting power over you. Right, because there's you you have no exit. There's there's no off ramp from from that. So when I was talking about the, uh, you know, I agree with that. By the way, and that, I think that's an important insight. When I was thinking about the meanness and the dumbness and in, in middle school, I was thinking about you know the Dinesh D'Souza stuff, you know, the Laura Ingram, you know, mocking the police officers and that kind of just silly stuff. That just the total lack of respect. I'm also thinking of this uh, U.S. Senate candidate in Ohio, Josh Mandel, um, used to be considered a mainstream Republican. Now he's running in in a primary where there seems to be a contest, not just for who's the Trumpiest candidate, but who is the dumbest candidate. He put out a tweet over the weekend. And this is literally the tweet, okay? This is a grown man. I just, I just want to emphasize, this is a grown man running for U.S. Senate in Ohio. He wrote, the last letters in Democrat, rat. The last letters in Republican, I can. That should tell you everything you need to know. <laughs> yeah, about, I mean, uh, <laughs> about I spelling. Um, yeah, of course. Um, I, I, it's like, you're like if you're nine, you go, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you should just just imagine what their uh, what their anagrams for. Not that I know, mind you. Oh uh, no, no. So the the other one, okay. So it's so a little bit more serious. So Kevin McCarthy, um, who is the Republican leader in the House, uh, makes the, a joke. Uh, he now says it was. I was just joking. When I'm speaking at a fundraising group, everybody's probably heard this by now. I know that you have been uh, where he says, I'm looking forward to taking the gavel from Nancy Pelosi. Big cheers. And uh, then he feels the need to say it's going to really be hard not to hit her with it. So because, you know, jokes about, you know, smashing elderly women with hammers are not really always so funny. Now, he's saying it's a joke. Uh, there are other people who are saying you know, that this is so outrageous that, it, you know, it's trivializing violence against women and he should resign. I guess I'm coming back to my default position. It's just it's just the stupidity. It's just the juvenile dumbness all the fucking time. Yeah. So I'm sure it is a joke. Right. I mean, I, I don't think he's yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, it's it's a crude, um, inappropriate joke. And, yeah. you yeah. know, Kevin McCarthy 
there's something there's something about wanting to make a joke like that uh, that says something about who you think your audience is, right? That you know th- that your audience wants to hear jokes about violence against Nancy Pelosi. Um, uh, there's something in the ether right now in Republican uh, vocabulary and uh, and rhetoric that moves people toward the violent. Uh, maybe it's just a violent joke. Maybe it's, but, you know, there were lots of quips you could make about at that point. And, you know, only a certain number involved hitting uh, a, a yep. An octogenarian mm-hmm. woman with a hammer. That's exactly. You had a choice there. You had a menu that you could have gone to. You I know, mean, you, could, you could have gone I mean, with. I'm gonna, you know, do a happy dance when I do it. I'm gonna throw the gavel in the air <laughs> like a, a majorette. Um, but no, you went with the. I'm gonna hit the woman with the hammer, and you, you know that, that that that's. There, there's a reason Hilarious. why you think that's going to go over well with the audience that you're talking to. Oh yeah, and there will be no there'll be no fallout from this. Okay, so over the weekend, among the things that we 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 learned these no and this this is I I think you know I mean substantively um, awfully interesting these notes we're getting from the Department of Justice uh, showing that the president are urging the uh, acting attorney general to uh, overturn the election. Uh, according to the notes, uh, he had, uh, the former president said to the acting attorney general, well, just say the election was corrupt. Leave the rest to me, which is really quite just all I want from you. Attorney general says, hey, you know, we just can't overturn a presidential election. And Trump goes, yeah, that's OK. You just say it's corrupt. Leave the rest to me. And this is, a what, 10 days before January 6th. So. We're getting some more context for what happened, aren't we? Yes, and also uh, note the relationship between this and the Ukraine scandal, where you know he isn't asking Alexander Zelensky for you know you don't you don't have to indict Hunter Biden. Just say that there's an investigation. Just announce that it's being investigated. I can handle the rest, right? He doesn't say the I can handle the rest, but all he needs from these people is an announcement that there is a problem. And I and and the implication in one case and the explicit statement in the other is you give me that and I will I will take care of the rest. Uh his view of law enforcement has been entirely instrumental from the beginning. This is was ultimately the, you know, what did he want from Comey? He wanted a statement that he was not under investigation, right? Um, He wanted, at every stage, he cares more about the announcements from law enforcement than he does about the substantive actions. He wants the announcements to support his political positions. Yeah, because all he has to do is just say it to make it real in his world. I guess what really strikes me, though, is that even though Republicans claim that they want to move on from all of this, they want to turn the page, which is why they had to get rid of uh, Liz Cheney, because she just wouldn't stop talking about it. uh, They're not going to be able to move on from this because every week it feels like we're learning something new about what he did. I mean, you know, you start to make a little chart of all of the things that Donald Trump did seriously in his mind to overturn the election, that here you have him pushing the Department of Justice uh, to uh, do investigations, to simply declare the election uh, corrupt without n- necessarily any evidence. Uh, at the same time, he's uh, he's pressuring uh, election officials in Arizona. He's threatening election officials in Georgia. He's trying to get the, the legislatures in places like uh, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania to overturn the, the, the results. Uh, you had General Milley, um, other members of the military concerned about a military coup. And then you have January 6th. And I guess, you know, as we get a clearer picture, realize that January 6th is not just one, a one-off, one discrete event. It was the culmination of the attempts by the sitting president of the United States to use every lever of power that he understood to get this election thrown out. I mean, it's really 
I mean, you know, we, you and I, been, we've been talking about this for years now, but it's still breathtaking to realize what was happening in real time between the election and January 6th. Yeah. I mean, I, all the crack smoking, demon possessed jokes yeah. aside, yeah. Yeah. Um, there was an actual effort to reject the results of an election. And it operated at a number of different levels. And I actually thought the Democrats in the impeachment, uh, the impeachment managers did a very good job of presenting this. Um, it operated at a number of levels. There was the rhetorical uh, rejection of the election and the assertion uh, that there had been massive fraud. There were extensive attempts to litigate. So it operated at that legal level. It operated at a media level. There was, you know, the recruitment of the affiliated uh, broadcasters and networks and, and intellectuals uh, to promote this. Uh, there was uh, lobbying of the various government agencies, including the uh, state agencies, the county uh, election commissions, uh, the military and the Justice Department uh, to take legal action. And ultimately, when all of that failed, there was street violence. And uh, I think it is best to think of this as a coordinated a, yes. a coordinated effort across many modes of conduct and many uh, uh, different organs of power to prevent the transfer of power following an election defeat. And I, I just I just don't know how else to understand it or why uh, a large percentage of the population does not, you know, does not see it that way. Do you see what's going on now as a continuation of that? I'm, I was reading uh, David Frum's uh, excellent piece in The Atlantic where he's talking basically saying, you know, do not uh, try to normalize January 6th. But he points out, you know, that, you know, half a year, you know, has passed since supporters of the president stormed uh, Congress. The president was impeached. Most Republicans went on, you know, went along with it. Um, and yet he remains the Republican Party's best fundraiser. He's the clear front runner for the Republican presidential nomination. And Republicans who hold majorities in state legislators are uh, rewriting election laws to impose new difficulties on voters. And just in case there's not enough to deliver the outcomes they want, they are concentrating new powers in party controlled branches of state government. So how alarmed should we be by this? Because there are folks who say, well, you know what? We didn't work. He was too incompetent. The the institutions held. Um, you know, everything is, you know, that, you know, we 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 we, do we dodged that bullet. But but how alarmed should we be going forward? Oh, I think it's possible to accept that we we dodged a number of bullets, not just one and still have alarm about the state that we're in. I mean, you know, we dodged a bullet. It didn't, you know, but there's 10 more in the particular chamber that it came from. Um, uh, you know, uh, so look, is it right, right now we have a Justice Department that can be expected to use its legal authority to protect the right to vote? Um, we have a number of state legislatures that will can be expected to or are attempting to uh, curtail uh, voting in in the name of uh, prote preventing voter fraud, which is of course uh, almost entirely specious. Um, we uh, we have a Republican Party that has ma made fidelity to this myth um, a kind of defining identity principle. I think that's the scariest thing um, for the simple reason that in a two-party system, both parties eventually get power. And, you know, when you have a one of those parties that, as you so rightly put it, lost its mind um, and is not defining itself according to governing ideas, it's defining itself according to you know, cult of personality, mythological protestations of faith, um, 
you know, that's an extremely unhealthy basis for governance. And furthermore, the fact that that party is pretty avowedly undemocratic at this point uh, really gives rise for anxiety as to what happens when it inevitably acquires power at whatever level it acquires power. And so right now that's a problem at the state at a, in the state governments of a, of a bunch of states, actually a majority of states. Uh, at some point in the not too distant future, it could be the House of Representatives, which could flip uh, um, in the next election quite easily. Uh, it is a matter of, in the Senate, of the health of octogenarian yeah. uh, of uh, geezers. Um, and that can, you know, as, you know, that can change any time. Uh, and so I, I, I don't think it's a matter of panic, but I do think if you're not alarmed by the state of things right now, uh, there's probably a bit of complacency involved. So speaking of, of cult of personality, I have a book for you um, in case you're looking for something, I, because I just got a pitch from a, a PR firm in my, in my inbox this morning, born to fight Lincoln and Trump. Oh my. The, the first Republican president and the last Republican president, both terms ended too early question mark. Um, Abraham Lincoln and Donald Trump are two of a kind, despite terms in office separated by 150 years, both encountered biased press, deeply divisive uh, political environments, blah, 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 blah. Goes on to explain how basically there's there's the kind of the same person. Now here, here's, I'm going to have an elitist moment here. I'm sorry. I'm going to get ripped for this. So the author is a woman named uh, Gretchen Woolert. Her bio begins, this is the first sentence of her bio, the author of Born to Fight Lincoln and Trump. This is, I'm, this is not me cherry picking it. This is her first line of her bio. Woolert is an award-winning high school athlete and four-year college volleyball athlete, period. Yes, that, that it qualifies <laughs> one to, uh, to write a book about Abraham Lincoln and Donald yeah. Trump. You know, so I am, where, where editor comes in because you probably don't want to lead with that. Just, I mean, it's you put that there. That's wonderful. Maybe it's the great, last but, sentence. Yeah, you know, right. The right, first yeah, sentence yeah, should yeah, probably yeah. qualify you it's to something write else. Book. Yeah, right. You know, I am currently in my cabin in the woods in rural Virginia, which is in a seventy percent Trump county, and um, I, you know, there's a lot of places around uh, my cabin where you will see. Uh, Trump signs or Trump flags flying alongside Confederate flags. And subtle, uh, very you know, subtle. Uh, mm. People here, uh, I don't think, associate Donald Trump with Abraham Lincoln. Um, no. You know, and so, you know, in the, in the, like, this may be something that in certain, in certain corners, uh, it, it makes sense to to link because you know the Republican Party and Abraham Lincoln is a you know great American figure, but you know at the grassroots level, um, uh, people know that the forces that he is mustering are the forces that opposed Lincoln, not the forces of the Union Army. Hey, let's let's take a quick break here uh, because I'm, when I because I want to talk to you about what's going on with the Vax Wars, uh, the Delta variant, and and the masks, and the way in which uh, the politics seem to be escalating, even at the moment when you would have expected that people would be more sober. Uh, so, m more with Benjamin Wittes in a moment. Hey, Charlie Sykes here. Uh, just a quick reminder, if you sign up for Bulwark Plus, you will have access to our morning newsletters to JVL's Triad, uh, as well as our whole suite of podcasts. This one will remain free, but if you want to listen to The Secret Podcast or uh, participate in our live streams uh, or others like The Next Level Podcast, uh, please consider joining Bulwark Plus. We're back with uh, Benjamin Wittes from Lawfare. Um, I, I have to tell you, there, there are so many things that are kind of amazing to me, um, and I have talked about this, I'm, I'm sorry, probably extensively. People are probably bored hearing me talk about how how truly extraordinary it is to watch the uh, devolution of somebody like Senator Ron Johnson from my home state of Wisconsin. I mean, he as he descends from 
one conspiracy theory to another, but he managed to top himself today. Just this, just this morning, um, Ron, Ron John, who has now become Ron Anon, actually tweeted out, let me read you his tweet, Alex Berenson has been a courageous voice of reason throughout the pandemic. As a result, he has been censored. During his suspension on Twitter, you can find him on Substack, blah, 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 blah. He provides a valuable counter perspective to the group think mainstream media. Well, as you know, Alex Berenson is a crackpot's crackpot. I mean, this guy is batshit crazy. He has been peddling disinformation. He has been so offensively um, dishonest about this that, of course, he's been kicked off Twitter. Um, most recently, he was making offensive comparisons uh, between the Holocaust and uh, vaccination requirements. And Senator Ron Johnson uh, going all in on one of the worst purveyors of false information about the vaccines. I mean, ev even given his track record, it is it is kind of breathtaking. And as Josh Jordan said, this is that tweet alone should cost him reelection. That tweet alone would suggest that he's not fit for public office. Yeah. So I think the strange alliance between the anti-vaxxers and the far right, uh, which now has eaten up much of the rest of the right, uh, is one of the, you know, weird aspects of this time. There's no, uh, you know, as you've noted on this podcast a number of times, there's no reason why the right shouldn't take credit for the vaccine, given the, uh, the fact that you know, the Trump administration actually played a not inconsiderable role in uh, hastening acquisition of it and encouraging development. Um, but and and similarly, there's no particular reason why the anti-vax movement does not emerge from the right. It's not a you know, you don't normally associate it with uh, with right-wing politics. And yet the merger between the two is almost complete, complete. at this yeah. point. And, um, and the irony is that this means um, that Ron Johnson's rhetoric is likely to result in the deaths of his own supporters more than uh, anybody else. Um, and so, I, you know, I don't, really have a good explanation for that. Um, you, do, you wouldn't think that encouraging, encouraging your supporters not to do something that will cause them, uh, you know, the, the failure to do will cause threat to themselves, their families, and people like them, which is to say your own electoral base. It shouldn't be good politics. And yet no. all of these professional politicians seem to be acting on it. No. And again, we're, we're, we're at this strange moment where and I, in my newsletter this morning, I asked, you know, is the Delta variant being overhyped? And the answer is yes and, and no. Uh, we had these very scary headlines over the weekend about, you know, the, the breakthrough uh, infections when the reality is that the vast, vast majority of, of vaccinated people are not being affected by this. The vaccines are working amazingly. Only 0.004% of vaccinated people that were later infected have been hospitalized for the virus. 0.001% have died, you know, per the CDC. So if you are vaccinated, um, this is not going to be a problem. But the problem is that we are, are seeing this, this crisis of the unvaccinated. And it's all about vaccines. I, I, I do think that the, the whole mask debate seems to me like a distraction. We wouldn't have to have masks. We wouldn't have to have shutdowns and rules if people would get vaccinated. And at this moment, what do you have? You have a United States senator from my state who is aligning himself with this anti-vax a nut job is is too nice because I mean he, the guy's a charlatan. It is it's the fundamental dishonesty. It's a con man. It's the guy selling snake oil. And you're absolutely right. If people do not get vaccinated, they are at real risk, and they're you know at risk of creating an environment for that will be dangerous for the rest of us as well as well at some point. So again, I I don't know. I'm I'm kind of done trying to explain why this has become politicized. I mean, how do you come down on the issue 
of requirements. Um, I know it's a number of private companies uh, are now mandating that their employees get uh, get get vaccinated. In France, they've gone so far as to say that if you don't if you don't have proof of vaccination, you can't go to restaurants and bars. Uh, I, I I don't have I personally don't have a problem with that. Yeah, I'm pretty hard line about this. I support vaccine passports. Um, I think that the CDC should have a, make an app available that um, you can use as your proof of vaccination. Mm-hmm. And um, and I support the right of any business to say I won't do business with you if you're not vaccinated. And I support the right of any individual to say, I won't personally do business with you if you, as in, uh, you know, have close contact with you if you're not vaccinated. Um, I And I would personally have no compunction about doing that myself. I, I The vaccines work extremely well. They don't work so well that the fact that I am vaccinated means I have absolutely nothing to fear from Mm -hmm. somebody who is not. And by the way, since I can carry the the virus, even though I'm vaccinated, the children in my orbit, the Mm -hmm. unvaccinated uh, younger people or uh, uh, um, people who are maybe whose vaccines are not as effective for them because they have some degree of immunosuppression are not um uh are not protected and so i simply don't accept the idea that there is no role for like i you know for I, I, I'm agnostic as to whether a vaccine mandate is appropriate, but I'm not agnostic about whether proof of vaccination is a legitimate uh, basis for uh, excluding people from from your presence. No, and there's a long, I mean, precedent. It's it again. I, I, I we've, I've said this over and over again. I mean, anybody that sent any kid to a, a school. It schools knows that you have to have proof of immunization, proof of vaccinations, and that's really never been that massively uh, controversial before. You want to travel internationally, you have to prove it. But this is where I get, and you, you raise the issue of the unvaccinated children. This is where I get, or I suppose I get close to the incandescent rage that I'm trying to fight against uh, because I have two very young grandchildren that I am really counting on being able to see. I have two grandchildren who live in France who I have not been able to see in two years. And it is the resistance to vaccination that poses the greatest danger to to them and obviously is going to, uh, you know, be... Uh, you know, an, an impediment to my ability to see them. So, I mean, this is this is what's really frustrating about it. it. And so, when you when you have the the lies on Fox News, when you have the people playing these stupid games about vaccination, um, there are real world consequences. And 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 you know, you and I are probably going to be okay. But that doesn't mean that there. Are, I mean, there's a whole part of this population that right now is not does not have access to the vaccination. And, you know, un, un, until they do, it's just incredibly reckless. That's as if right. They have a, as if they have no responsibility to the community whatsoever. And by the way, some percentage of you and I are not going to be okay. Right. So mm-hmm. I have, uh, as you know, I do a live show, which you have been on yeah. every day uh, uh, on YouTube and Crowdcast called In Lieu of Fun. And there's a gentleman who is a regular member of the audience of In Lieu of Fun who uh, did everything right, got both vaccination shots and uh, recently disappeared from the audience. Um, and the audience noticed that he wasn't there and we hunted down where he was, and he was hospitalized in intensive care with a breakthrough COVID case. Mm. And, you know, and this was not somebody who had been reckless. It is not somebody who uh, was simply a vector for transmission to other to other people who were unvaccinated. This was a fully vaccinated person, has no idea how he got Delta. Um, he is, by the way, okay now. Um, oh, that's good. It's um, so I mean, it's not just recklessness with respect to children and uh, uh, immunosuppressed people, uh, though that would be enough. It is also that 
Some cases do break through and a small percentage of breakthrough cases do involve serious illness. And so your, your plan with fire um, on behalf of everybody you interact with, and I think a certain amount of, of you know, like the, the attempt to treat exclusion of such people from our company as a form of invidious discrimination is really pernicious. It's, it is. you know, I, I think we are allowed as a society to exclude people who are behaving deplorably, and I want to use the word deplorably intentionally, um, and who are endangering other people that is a form of discrimination in which I believe. That, that's almost what a healthy society does. That's the definition of a healthy society, right? Is, is, is that so. it will enforce certain norms and that if you are anti-social, there will be consequences. And conservatives used to understand that. Yeah, I, I actually think, you know, the, the idea, you know, if, if you want to be an unvaccinated person, Fine. wear a sign. Yeah. You know, don't come near me. I'm unvaccinated. So, some sort of a symbol, I, I guess. Maybe just wearing a, uh, you know, Make America Great Again hat would do it. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I'm, guess, I'm guessing that where you are right now, there's probably a lot of people who have all, all kinds of signs on their cars that, that you could reasonably interpret as saying that they are not vaccinated. OK, so can we switch gears for a moment? Indeed. Um, because I was going to actually ask you this earlier when we were talking about what was going on with the elections, what was going on with uh, the with voting, voting rights, et cetera. On a larger scale, uh, your thoughts about Merrick Garland and the and the Justice Department, not just on the issue of elections and, um, and, and, and voting, but just in general. I know that there are some people who have been disappointed that he has not been more aggressive in pursuing accountability for members of the Trump administration. But he has taken some steps recently to uh, strip the administ strip administration official, former administration officials of, uh, of, of executive privilege um, also. Over the weekend, rather remarkably, uh, I thought, uh, saying that the the Trump's tax returns needed to be turned over to the House Ways and Means Committee. So just give me your, you know, give me the Ben Wittes sense of, of uh, you know, report card on, on Merrick Garland. And, and if you've been able to determine a Garland doctrine for the Justice Department. All right. So Merrick Garland is an old personal friend and somebody I care about a lot. Um, and he is also somebody who I believe I was the first person in public to suggest before the election even that Joe Biden should name as attorney general. And so this is not a subject on which I'm entirely unbiased. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, I think that um, I think two things. Uh, uh, first of, is that it's actually too early to evaluate. And the reason is that a bunch of um, a bunch of things are clearly in process that are going to matter how they come out. So, for example, you know there was an indictment recently of Tom Barrack, the mm -hmm. uh, uh, chair of the former president's inaugural committee, which is, by the way, a shocking indictment that has been undercovered, in my view. Mm. Um, there is also, as we know, a pending investigation of Rudy Giuliani. Mm -hmm. um, now, imagine for a minute that Rudy Giuliani is indicted two weeks from now or four weeks from now, um, and some other cases come to fruition. And so you would be able to say about the Justice Department under Merrick Garland that in the first eight or 10 months, uh, they had indicted the president's personal lawyer, uh, the chair of his inaugural committee, Matt Gates, who's you know clearly has some jeopardy. Right, go down the list of people who we have some reason to think they they may be facing charges over the next few months. You might look at that situation very differently from a situation in which. Um, uh, um, uh, basically the status quo prevailed. Furthermore, 
uh, I think the Justice Department's posture with respect to the one sixth committee is going to matter a great deal. Yes. So I expect the one sixth committee will issue a barrage of subpoenas over the next few weeks. And that at least some people who are uh, recipients of those subpoenas will resist them. Um, unlike the impeachment committees, which took place during the Trump administration and couldn't expect any assistance from the Justice Department, the one sixth committee can probably expect substantial assistance from the Justice Department in compelling uh, people to uh, testify and in enforcing. Uh, contempt orders. So, um, what would that look? What would that look like? So, they they subpoena Jim Jordan or they subpoena Kevin McCarthy. He refuses to come in. Is it a criminal referral? So they uh, move to compel, mm -hmm. or they hold him in contempt, and they refer the contempt order to the Justice Department for prosecution. Uh, the Justice Department at that point can choose to move on it or not. So you're going to feel very mm -hmm. differently about mm -hmm. Merrick Garland if he leaves Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger out to dry, right, where they have voted to hold somebody in contempt and the Justice Department won't do anything about it than if they bring a case under those circumstances. Um, and then finally, there are, you know, a series of things that have been percolating for, you know, for a long time that are either going to peter out or, uh, or burst onto the public scene. And so I would say in the broad scheme of things, my first point is, you know, wait at least a year from the mm -hmm. time he takes office and evaluate the picture at that point. Um, uh, the second point is... Look, anybody who believed that Merrick Garland uh, was going to be a crusading, you know, Elliot Spitzer kind of attorney general, I don't mean Elliot Spitzer in the laugh riot sense, yeah. but in Elliot Spitzer in the, you know, he had a, he was a particularly activist, you know, model of state attorney general. Anybody who thinks that Merrick thought that Merrick Garland was going to be that does not know Merrick Garland. Um, he is a cautious institutionalist. Um, and to the extent that there is a Merrick Garland doctrine, it is let us restore the norms of the Justice Department that w were done violence to over the last four years. And you don't do that without disappointing people. Because what the activists, both of the left and the the accountability world, want is a crusading accountability attorney general, and Merrick Garland is not going to be that. He's going to be the the figure who tries successfully or unsuccessfully to reestablish the way the Justice Department is supposed to behave by modeling that behavior. And that often means acting with restraint. And it often means acting in a fashion that's consistent with the historic way that the Justice Department behaves, even when that's frustrating for people. And so I do think, and by the way, I say this in praise, not in criticism, mm -hmm. that if you want to reestablish the the bipartisan normal expectations of the Justice Department over the past 50 years, you can't do it by erring all the time on the side of, you know, right. of accountability. You have to do it to some degree by by reestablishing the legitimacy of the exactly the sort of constraint that Bill Barr did not show. And so I do think um a, it's important to wait and see what the whole picture looks like, and B, that picture will contain substantial elements of disappointment for, you know, for for people who want the Justice Department to go on an accountability crusade against the previous administration. It, it is a very, very delicate balance, but uh, I, I guess with his experience, uh, there are a few people who are 
really more qualified to be doing, you know, walking this particular tightrope, the, you know, accountability for legitimacy, the politics, the not politics. Uh, so your basic bottom line is we just have to wait a year and see what happens. All these things play out. I do think that the handling of the one six, uh, committees, uh, subpoenas will be, a, will, will be a really interesting litmus test for uh, their approach. I, I think it will. I, there are going to be some other really interesting litmus tests too. So, uh, the justice department has less authority in the voting rights context than it used to, but it still has some. Uh, and the fact that the you know Justice Department relatively quickly sued the state of Georgia uh, uh, suggests, I think, that if Texas can ever get its act together and corral its legislature back together and pass a voting restriction bill, it can expect a significant litigation from the Justice Department. That's different from under the Trump administration. Um, <laughs> another important area uh, will be these various investigations, which are, you know, some of which we know about. Uh, and the, 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 the one that's easiest to talk about is the Rudy Giuliani investigation. They clearly have a lot of material there because they had enough to get a search warrant, right? Um, I don't think that investigation is going to lie fallow, but it'll look like it'll lie, it's lying fallow until the day it produces an indictment. And so I think, you know, it's, it's important to keep an eye on the totality of this stuff. Um, and I think the fact that when the Barrack indictment happened, it was, it was, you know, honestly less covered than it warranted, um, uh, suggests that the media culture doesn't quite know what it wants from the department. Or um, they have to recalibrate their just level of like, oh, my God, this is really, really a big thing um, since we've had so many, many big things. You don't I, you really I don't mean, you know. You know what I'm saying? It's just but, like but this was this was so big. A, an allegation by the United States Department of Justice that the campaign speeches of Donald Trump were being edited by the United Arab Emirates. That's amazing. That is in the indictment, <laughs> that the text of a speech was sent to Tom Barrack, who sent it to officials of the UAE, who asked for changes in a, in a presidential candidate speech and got them. It's almost like some form of collusion, but I, I wouldn't say that, right? I mean, yeah, that would be, that would be going almost too far. like they weren't patriots or something. Almost like it wasn't America first. Who knew? Benjamin Wittes, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. We appreciate it very much. A pleasure as always. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow. We will do this all over again.